We're officially 72 days away from the start of the 2023 NFL season, 229 away from Super Bowl 58, but who's really counting that far, right? But today we're going to do some ambitious forward thinking. I'm going to give you guys 10 super bold predictions going into the new year, and I guess I should preface this by saying that some of these will be crazy, right? I don't expect all 10 of these to happen, so let me know down in the comments which ones you agree with, which ones you can see happening. But before we get into that, this is your early reminder to subscribe to the channel, uh, support the channel in general, right? But we're on the road to 500 subs on the channel, and we can't get there without y'all, right? We appreciate any and all support. But without further ado, this is the Anomaly Podcast. Let's get into some bold predictions. And we're going to start here at number one with Trevor Lawrence winning the 2023-24 NFL MVP. Uh, when we look back at previous seasons, right, there's some individual campaigns that correlate with certain years, at least to me, right? For example, 2015 and Cam Newton. Cam Newton had an amazing year. The Panthers went to the Super Bowl and Cam Newton won the MVP. One of the best years we've seen from, a, from an individual player. Or like in 2013 with Peyton Manning, right? When Peyton Manning had that explosion of a year, he has the most passing touchdowns ever for a single season. That still stands to this day, by the way. But my point there is that there are certain players that in, in, in individual seasons, they've been so dominant that years have resonated with them, right? Now, I think getting the MVP award helps that most times, right? When we think of certain years, okay, who won the MVP in 2020 or 2019? You kind of correlate certain years with certain indi individual campaigns, right? But to me, I had to break that down. What is the formula to winning MVP and leaving this impact to correlate with certain years? To me, you have to win a bunch of games, right? Maybe have a couple postseason wins, even though it's a regular season award. And then you have to have a great individual statistical year, right? And to me, I think a guy that could do that this year, based off of his circumstances, is Trevor Lawrence. You know, this is a guy that under Doug Peterson improved in every major statistical category last season, right? His completion percentage went up by almost seven. He went up by 13 touchdowns. He had nine less interceptions. And his overall QB rating went up by 24. But Jacksonville, they're, they're, they also won a division last year. And they also won a playoff game last year in one of the craziest games that I've ever seen. Right? Shout out to the Chargers. But it's now year two under Doug Peterson. And I'm only expecting Trevor to take another step up. And I'm only expecting this team to take an overall step up. Right? Statistically speaking, all signs point to Trevor Lawrence having a way better year across the board. And as far as team success... I mean, there's more continuity, right? They brought in a top five level of talent at the wide receiver position in Calvin Ridley. They have a relatively weak division, maybe the weakest in football. So this team should go out there and win a bunch of games in their division, should sweep their division, as well as they have the 10th easiest schedule in the league, right? So this team should win 12, 13 games, maybe even 14 games to have a crazy year. Trevor Lawrence should have a way better statistical year. And if that can happen, I can easily see this team being an, a, a one or two seed, winning tons of games, and Trevor having statistical success, right? And if that all happens, the MVP is Trevor Lawrence's, and I think in a year or two, we're going to be like, man, Trevor Lawrence and the Jags, they had a crazy season just a few years ago. My number two is going to be, and you know, I'm going to start this by saying number two hurts me a little bit, right? But Kyler Murray, I believe he will be replaced and traded or somewhat he'll be cut, whatever, after this next season. After being the number one pick, I think in 2019 for the Arizona Cardinals, I, I, Kyler Murray's time in Arizona has been like a roller coaster. It's been up and down to say the least. Uh, this guy had a good rookie season. He went on to have a Pro Bowl season in his sophomore year, right? And then this Arizona team was like, you know what? We got our franchise guy. Let's go trade for DeAndre Hopkins. Kyler, as, uh, with DeAndre Hopkins and, and that Arizona Cardinal team, they went on to have an 8-0 start. I believe they were 10-1 or 10-2 at one point. And, you know, sure, things did fall apart after that 8-0, that 10-0 start, whatever it was. But this team still made the playoffs that year, and Kyler went back-to-back -back years as a pro bowler, right? So he looked well on his way to proving everybody wrong at his size, proving to everybody that he could be a franchise guy at 5'10", right, at, at his smaller frame. But during last season, however... Right, this Kyler Murray was three and eight as a starter. He tore his ACL, and that might keep him out for the majority of this year. Right, so if you're at home and you're keeping count, he his first three years were good. So he's had three good seasons. Last year was a bad one, so one bad one. 
right? So why would Arizona go out there? Why would they trade? Why would they replace Kyler Murray? It, to me, things change quick in the NFL, right? Things change quick, and the Cardinals have just brought in a new regime. Kyler Murray was Cliff Kingsbury guy coming out of college, and when Cliff Kingsbury came into uh, the NFL and he stepped in as the coach of the Arizona Cardinals, Kyler Murray was his guy, right, from day one. And that might not be the case for the new head coach, Jonathan Gannon, right? He might not want to bank his coaching career and his and his future on Kyler Murray, right? We see all the time when new regimes take over, they love to leave their mark, right? Now, for example, in the NBA just, just a year ago, a new regime came in for the Minnesota Timberwolves, and they stepped in and they said, we need to make a change. They ended up trading six first-round picks for Rudy Gobert. <laughs> that might be one of the worst trades in NBA history. This stuff happens, right? It happens in sports. Coaches and GMs want to go out on their own terms. They don't want to go out on the previous regime's bets, right? They don't want to go out on other regime's players and who they believed in, right? Coaches and GMs, when they step into new situations, they want to leave their mark and go out on their own terms. And as we've seen this offseason, this new regime in Arizona has left their mark and this team has kind of fell, fell apart a little bit, right? But there's also been a report from an Atlanta Falcons insider that Kyler Murray was almost dealt to the Falcons during this past NFL draft. But the deal fell through because of Kyler's contract and the potential cap hit it would leave on the Arizona side of things. So I, 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 if that report is true, like hypothetically, let's say that report is true, this team isn't committed to Kyler Murray. Right, So with this team projected to finish in the range of maybe grabbing a Drake May or Caleb Williams, some of the top quarterback prospects in next year's draft, and with this team having a new regime, I believe that this team will find a way to trade Kyler Murray after next year or cut him right, and build this team back up from ground zero with the quarterback of their choosing. Right, This GM and their coach with Jonathan Gannon. He might not want to die on the hill of Kyler Murray, and I understand that. You know, for in his in his position, he he wants to go out on his own terms. These are the guys I selected, and if it failed, it failed. You know, I I know that I failed with the guys I selected, right? It's that mindset. It's like a control thing, but I think it's just funny that Kyler Murray's time in this scenario would end the way uh, the, the it would end the exact way of the guy that he replaced did. You know, of Josh Rosen. Josh Rosen had an okay rookie year. And then boom, he was replaced, right, from Kyler Murray, even though his situation wasn't the best. Uh, but moving over to number three, Devontae Adams requests a trade and he wants out of Las Vegas just after being traded there this past offseason. But this one is simple. You know, this franchise is in a much different place than it was just a year ago, you know, from the excitement for this team going into last year with the Devontae Adams trade. You know, I, I think a lot of people had them winning 12, 13 games, winning the division over Kansas City and competing in the playoffs. But all of that hype from the city, from the from the media, it all quickly dwindled, right? It all quickly faded as the team finished 6-11, and 11, right? Which was, which was the worst finish in Devontae Adams' career as a team record perspective. And last offseason, I mean, Devontae Adams, his main reason to, for leaving Green Bay was, of course, money. But the next biggest reason was that he wanted to team up with a good friend. He wanted to team up with his old college quarterback at Fresno State in Derek Carr. Derek Carr, as we all know, is no longer a Las Vegas Raider. He was he was later cut and signed by the New Orleans Saints. There has been reports since that has happened, since Derek Carr has been cut, that Devontae Adams no longer sees eye-to-eye -eye with the franchise, and most of the time he questions the future direction of the team. Right, he in a, in, a, in an interview with, uh, with someone from the Ringer, I believe it was, but he said this is not what I expected to happen with this organization, but it's something that's the reality now, right? So Devonte Adams, you can tell he's 30 years old. We know he, we know he only has really two to three elite years left, probably three to four good years left, right? In the NFL, he's 30 years old. The shelf life is shorter on these wide receivers, and he still wants to compete at a high level. Right. I wouldn't be surprised that even though he's home and in Las Vegas, if this team gets off to a slow start going into the next year, I wouldn't be surprised if Devontae Adams demands a trade and sits out the second half of the year or is traded at the midseason mark. Uh, but but no doubt to me, I think it's it's kind of something that's gaining traction that Devontae Adams might not be a Raider for long. But to me, I think it, it, with his situation and with the, with the franchise's direction, it makes a lot of sense for Devontae Adams to want out of Las Vegas. But number four is that Jordan Love is the real deal. This is a guy who has to succeed Aaron Rodgers. This is a guy that has to continue the great history of Packer quarterbacks. It's going to be no small task, right, to say the least.
But this is a 24-year-old quarterback out of Utah State. And I think he had the privilege to learn from Aaron Rodgers the last few years. And now it's his turn to leave his mark. Let's not forget, this is a guy that's six foot four, 220 pounds. He has the size of a franchise changer, right? But this is a guy that has a very quick and accurate delivery with the ball, just like Aaron Rodgers. If you watch him in college compared to the pros, he looks a lot like Aaron Rodgers, his prodigy, right? But he has extreme poise. You can trust him to sit in the pocket, make those tough throws, be a leader, right? But this Green Bay team, I mean, Jordan loves stepping into, uh, into a position that has a good old line an uh, above average defense, two good running backs, and Christian Watson, a guy who is a second year man looking to take that superstardom leap here at the wide receiver position. His head coach is also very offensive focused, right? And not to mention Jordan Love. I mean, we've seen this entire offseason, whether it was Jair Alexander or Elton Jenkins. This, this, Jordan Love has the locker room behind him. The team loves Jordan Love as a player, as a leader, and it's all there for him to succeed. He just has to go out there and perform. He has to do his part. But I want to be clear on this. I don't expect the Packers to be electric in Jordan Love's first year. I don't expect him to come out and have 10-11 wins and make the playoffs and maybe a playoff game. Let's look back at history of the Green Bay quarterbacks, right? When Brett Favre, legendary quarterback, maybe the best in franchise history, in his first year with Green Bay, right after coming over from the Falcons, he was 8-5 and five as a starter. His last year with the team, when he left it, he was 13-3. Right, Rodgers took over after a 13, 13 and three team, and he was six and ten in his first year. <laughs> now we know Rodgers would go on, and he'd had four MVPs, maybe be the best in franchise history. But now Rodgers left. He left the team at eight and nine, a, a, a lot more manageable of expectations compared to thirteen and three with Brett Favre. But he left the door, and he's now in New York, right? Just like Brett Favre was. Jordan Love is now stepping in. I don't believe you can expect the same production from a year one of a successor to the legend that was just behind him, right? The, the one that just left the door. So you can't expect legend productivity from a first-year successor. But I expect Jordan Love, I expect him to come in, show tons of flashes, and prove he can be the guy moving forward. And after all, I mean, this might be biased, but he was my favorite quarterback in that class outside of Joe Burrow in the 2020 class. And I've been on this bandwagon for such a long time. I mean, it, it was to the point where I wanted the Browns to draft Jordan Love. Right? And that was while Baker Mayfield was leading us to the playoffs for the first time in such a long time. Right, So Jordan Love, I've, I've believed in him for years and years. It's just his time to prove me right. My number five prediction is that Sean McVay retires per multiple articles throughout this entire offseason and throughout the last couple years, really. Uh, the, the Rams coach Sean McVay is likely to retire once the core of Matthew Stafford, Aaron Donald, and Cooper Cup are no longer with the team. Um, I know these are speculations, right? But to me, when Stafford, when Matt Stafford and Aaron Donald may both be gone next year, we know Matthew Stafford's getting up there in age. He's on a contract year. Aaron Donald, I mean, he's he's contemplated retirement after they won the Super Bowl, right? So with both of those guys maybe being gone, this team is going to be in a very rough spot going forward, right? They're going to be set to rebuild with no assets. I mean, this team traded away quite literally everything to win that Super Bowl a couple years ago, and now they have nothing. Right? They just traded Jalen Ramsey away for a third-round pick and a backup tight end. This is a team that's in a very rough spot going forward. But at the end of the day, I mean, Sean McVay, he's a Super Bowl coach at just 37 years old. He's one of the youngest coaches in the league still. And he's talked about taking a step away from the game to spend more time with his family. I mean, he's still young enough to take a year or two away from the game, maybe even three or four years away, to spend some time with his kids. Take that mental break that he needs and in two or three years, if he, if he wants to return to the game, he's a Super Bowl champion head coach. He's going to be able to choose where he would like to return and to continue to be a part of the game that he loves at the head coaching position. You know, I, I think also a big part of this is that, you know, if this team does commit to a rebuild this offseason, I think it's the perfect time for McVay to get out, right, to take a step away. Because this Rams team can bring in a new regime at the head coaching spot. They can draft whatever with, with whatever draft capital they have and build through a new young core, have a new era, quote-unquote, with this team. And, I mean, let's just say Aaron Donald retires, as well as Sean McVay. They can go out there and trade Cooper Cup. They can trade Matthew Stafford, or he can walk, right? I mean, this team can just really fully hit the reset button, get some draft capital from those guys, and kind of, you know, start new. Start a new era in Los Angeles. But, I mean, Sean McVay, 
in a couple years, if you want to return, the Browns will always be there. <laughs> As a biased Browns fan, I'd love to see Sean McVay uh, step in the doors here in a couple years. This one is very ambitious, but my number sixth prediction is that Calvin Ridley will be an all-pro receiver this season. You know, maybe I'm too big of a believer in the Jags this year. But a lot of the same for what I said about Trevor can be said about Calvin Ridley. This is year two under Doug Peterson, a team that should only be better as a unit, offensively especially, but it's a relatively weak division with a relatively weak defenses aside from maybe the Colts. But Calvin Ridley has had a year to rest for his body to get stronger, faster, whatever you want to say, right? But he's now going to be the wide receiver one on a team that's going to have an MVP level candidate at the quarterback position in Trevor Lawrence. I believe, Cal, or I believe Calvin Ridley is going to have some rust in the first three weeks or so of the season because there's nothing like game shape, right? But from week four on, watch out. I, I really watch out because Calvin Ridley is going to explode. I, I, I think, you know, all pro, I think he's going to be an all pro receiver. And, you know, just to clarify, all pro teams usually carry six receivers, right? So he's going to have to be a top six guy, but I think it's definitely possible for him to be a top three guy this upcoming year, statistically wise, right? Maybe not talent wise, but statistically, Calvin Ridley can be that guy for Jacksonville that they haven't really had a dominant alpha receiver in their time. But regardless, Calvin Ridley can be that guy for them this season. Um, the Offensive Rookie of the Year will be Jordan Addison. And I know all offensive awards are usually quarterback awards, right? But these are bold predictions. And to me, Jordan Addison will be a guy that could potentially win the Offensive Rookie of the Year. With Adam Thielen and Dalvin Cook leaving this offseason for the Minnesota Vikings, there's going to be 163 open targets for someone to take, right? For anybody to take. And I know Justin Jefferson's great. I know TJ Hawkinson is great. But those guys aren't going to take that much, you know, all of those targets, right? Uh, that would be absurd. It'd be like 400 targets apiece. But Jordan Hadson, I mean, he was my favorite wide receiver in this class. One of my favorite players in general in this class. And he's going to a team in the Minnesota Vikings that lost a lot this offseason, especially on the defensive side of the ball. So I think this team is going to need to score tons of points and be a pass-first offense. And to me, that only benefits Jordan Addison, right? All reports say that he's he's looked very good in camp, and he's really solidified that number two role. But to me, I mean, <laughs> it, it's all there for Jordan and Addison to have a great year and take this award by, by a long shot, right? Plus, there's no really guarantee that, that Bryce Young or Anthony Richardson or C.J. Stroud it's not a guarantee any of these young quarterbacks will succeed out the gate. I think usually quarterbacks will need a year or two to adapt to the game. Jordan Addison's not. He's just going to have to step in and be the great talent that he had, that he is. And I think next to Justin Jefferson taking away double teams every game, Jordan Addison can have a very good year um, in, in 2023. But my number eight is going to be Miles Garrett winning the defensive player of the year. And I have to be biased somewhere, right? But my overall rule of thumb in sports or in fantasy football is never bet on the Cleveland Browns, right? In any facet. I don't care how good the player is or how good it looks or what their expectations are. Don't ever bet on the Cleveland Browns, right? <laughs> It'll save you a lot of money. Uh, but I have to be somewhat ambitious going into this next year. And luckily for me, this one kind of just makes sense. And this one could very well happen. But Miles Garrett, I mean, this is a guy that's averaged about 12 and a half sacks a season throughout his first six years. But let's keep in mind, he's missed some time. And there hasn't always been a lot of help around him, right? Especially as of late. But a positive, though, for me is that Jim Schwartz is now the defensive coordinator in Cleveland, right? And this is the part of the year where I'm going to get ambitious and hope that this Browns defense actually is somewhat decent, somewhat relevant, right? But Jim Schwartz is coming in with a scheme of a wide nine scheme, right? For those not familiar with the wide nine, this is a defense that spreads the D-line out, and it's basically a C-ball, get-ball style of defense, a very aggressive style of defense. But this scheme makes it very hard for teams and offenses to double-team the defensive ends. In this case, Miles Garrett is a defensive end. He's an edge. It's very hard to, to double the team those guys with how far they're spaced out. Even though that they're going to be spread out on the edges, I think Miles Garrett with the, with the speed and power that he does have, there's no doubt he's going to be able to close that gap very quick each and every play. And with Zadarius Smith on the other side, it's going to be even harder to double team a guy like Miles Garrett, right? So this is a guy that if he's rarely double teamed, you know, with the speed and power that he has, saying that he's had 16 sacks the last two years, this is a guy that could explode and have 20-plus sacks this year and really be in the running, right, for um, <laughs> Defensive Player of the Year, right? The Browns' defense, I mean, to me, they project to be in the top half of the league at least, 
And if Miles Garrett can be healthy, if he can get 20 plus sacks and, you know, or, or very close to it, and this Browns defense can be a top 10 defense, I think this can be a reality where Miles Garrett does end up winning Defensive Player of the Year. But at the end of the day, there's so many other great Defensive Player of the Years, you know, or de- Defensive Players in the league, right, that could win this award, like TJ Watt, like Nick Bosa, like Michael Parsons, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many other great options for this award. But I'm going to be a Browns fan here, and I'm going to say Miles Garrett can finally get it done. I'm going to say we can finally put it together and make something crazy happen. When's the last time a Browns player won an award, right? But uh, Offensive Player of the Year, it's going to be Jamar Chase. In the last 10 years of this award, right, only four four quarterbacks have won this award. And none of those have been in the last four years, right? So I can safely say it's a skill position award for the Offensive Player of the Year. Um, And if the Bengals are as dominant as I think they can be, this shouldn't be a shock to you or to me or anybody that Jamar Chase could come away with this award at the end of the year. And to be honest, ever since Jamar Chase has stepped in the door in Cincy, the the other co-receiver there in T. Higgins, his production has went down each and every year. But even when Jamar Chase got injured and he came back, you couldn't tell that he was injured because of the production levels that he saw. You know, and it was almost like once he came back, T. Higgins continued to be an afterthought in this offense. I don't see a world where that stops, where T. Higgins' production suddenly goes back up. I see it, if anything, going down and Jamar Chase taking a bigger step up to be that more of an elite wide receiver. You can't beat the connection that Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase do have together. But I believe Joe Burrow will most likely win the MVP award, right, if I had to put money on it. But if he doesn't and the runner, you know, and and let's say Joe Burrow's a top three candidate or he's the runner up, he's still going to have some insane stats to me this year. And everything points to Jamar Chase taking another step up production-wise like we just mentioned. You know, I mean, not to mention, I mean, Joe Mixon, he might miss some games. T. Higgins can't compete on a production level. Tyler Boyd, he's only getting older, but he's only a wide receiver three at best at this point in his career. This award should be Jamar Chase's uh, on a Cincinnati offense that could dominate the league, right, if, if they can all stay healthy and be productive. To me, it's the Bengals' year to win the Super Bowl. To finish off, my 10th bold prediction is going to be that the Cincinnati Bengals will win Super Bowl 58. Uh, I mean, again, like I mentioned in the intro, we're only 229 days away from uh, Super Bowl 58. And not that I want the season to end, right? I mean, that's that's the best part of the season, but it's the worst part of the season because you know it's the last game you're going to see for a couple months, right? But this prediction has been the same for me all offseason. Ever since the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, I said Cincinnati's going to win it next year. But if you missed last Tuesday's video where I went through my updated power rankings, go check that out. But like I've said all offseason, this will be Cincy's year no matter what, no matter who they face. And let, let's go on who they will face, right? On the NFC side of things, I think with Philly retaining everybody and in a sense only getting better, bringing in Jalen Carter and uh, the receivers taking a step up, the offense is still there. It's hard to imagine them not repeating as NFC champs and making it back to the Super Bowl, right? But for, for Kansas City, right, we'll speak about the runner-ups in the AFC. For Kansas City, they're very talented. They have Pat Mahomes. They have Andy Reid. As, you know, as long as you have that duo, you're going to be Super Bowl competitive, right? But nobody in the NFL has, you know, nobody in the NFL has repeated as Super Bowl champions since the 2004-2005 season with the New England Patriots, right? So for the for, so for Kansas City's sake, I'm just going to say they fall short this year just because of that statistic. But for my AFC champs, like I mentioned, it's going to be the Cincinnati Bengals. And to me, this year it seems too perfect for them, right? Everything is following line. Um, as all flaws that they've had from last year, they've kind of been filled in a big way, right? And this team is coming into this year with a chip on their shoulder, trying to get back to the Super Bowl and trying to get finally over that hump. Uh, This is a guy in Joe Burrow that has been a winner, and he's trying to do that at the professional level. And to me, at this point, this team is Super Bowl or bust, right? But it's time to prove to the world the hype I've had behind Burrow for two years now, where I've said he's been the second best player in the world. Um, I've been on that Burrow hype train, and I've believed in Jamar Chase. I mean, I'm a Browns fan, right? So it's kind of crazy the belief I've had in the Cincinnati team. But I've had it right for years, and I believe Joe Burrow has been the best player for a couple, or the second best player in the league for a couple years now. Um, and to me, they, you know, if they can stay healthy and be relatively productive, they're gonna win this Super Bowl here against the Philadelphia Eagles in 2023. 
But just to recap here, I'm going to run through my top 10 bold predictions going into next year. And let me just say this, right? If you have any bold predictions, drop them down below. Like, I want to hear these bold predictions as these might sound crazy, right, to you guys. But to me, they make relatively some sense going into next year. But let me know some of your guys' bold predictions down below. I'd love to dive into those and, and, and analyze those with you guys down in the comments section. But Trevor Lawrence is going to win the MVP. It's going to be Kyler Murray's last year in Arizona as he's going to be replaced with the new regime. Devontae Adams is going to demand a trade at the midseason mark. Jordan Love is going to be the real deal where the team might not make the playoffs, but he's going to show flashes and be their franchise guy moving forward. Um, Sean McVay and Aaron Donald will retire for the Los Angeles Rams after this season as they're going to approach a new rebuild. They might trade Cooper Cup. They might let Matt Stafford go. Well, however you want to split it, I think the Rams finally deplete after this next year. Calvin Ridley, he's going to come into the year. He's going to be an all-pro receiver. That's good. That means he's going to be a top six receiver coming into the next year statistically wise, right? But he's going to be an all-pro starter. Uh, Jordan Addison, he's going to win the Offensive Rookie of the Year. Miles Garrett is going to win the Defensive Player of the Year. And staying in the AFC North, we're going to have Jamar Chase winning the Offensive Player of the Year. And the Bengals out of all teams, will defeat the Eagles in Super Bowl 58. I'm saying that the entire offseason, and I've, I'm still going to say that 229 days away from Super Bowl 58. But those are my top 10 bold predictions. I'm going to say it again. Let me know down in the comments what your bold predictions are. But uh, before we get out of here, I just want to run through some news. And on Thursday, we're going to have some uh, NBA free agency predictions. We're going to talk about that here in a second. But this is going to be some news, kind of like a prelude to that episode. But the first bit of news here, and this news came out last Thursday after I recorded the podcast. Uh, but I'm still going to throw this out there. Uh, Andrew uh, Wojnowski, right, the, one of the biggest NBA reporters out there, um, he ended up revealing that the Wizards in total received 10 total draft picks from the Phoenix Suns in that Bradley Beal trade. They had four first round picks and six second round picks. And it's interesting because the Phoenix Suns, they won't have a first-round pick until the 2031 season, right? And just for reference, those kids that are going to be in that draft class are 10 years old right now. <laughs> so right now, their scout, I mean, it might be the, use, the most useless position in sports right now for the Phoenix Suns. But those kids right now, they have to start going out to middle schools and start scouting these kids because they're not going to have a draft pick until then. But Kawhi Leonard, he had a successful knee injury on his torn meniscus in the playoffs, and he faces an eight-week recovery. I believe he's already a week or two into it. So shout out to Kawhi as hopefully he can get back and be healthy because that's all we've wanted to see from Kawhi the last couple of years. The Lakers have been reported to, they're going to match any offer on Austin Reeves this offseason. We know early in the offseason they said that we're really not going to go over 100 mil, but right now they're like, man, we know teams are going to give them 110 million and the Lakers are going to have to go out there and match that. But, I mean, hey, it's going to be worth it if he's going to give you the production that he did last season. And if not, I mean, at some, it, you can only expect Austin Reeves to improve off of last year, in all honesty, right? But Jakob Podol, a talented center there for the Toronto Raptors, he was traded back there uh, this past uh, midseason mark. But he's expected to stay with the Raptors here for $20 million plus a year. Um, that's surprising to me. Not, the, not that he's going to get that money, but that he's going to be going back to the Raptors. To be completely honest, I had him going to a different team this offseason. But if this is true, if he's going back to Toronto, I guess Toronto's going to run it back, you know, continue to be um, in mediocrity like they've been for the last couple years. But John Collins, the biggest news of yesterday was that he was traded to the Utah Jazz for Rudy Gay and a future second round pick. That's all, right? That is all for a guy that's making $100 plus million dollars he was traded for a guy that might retire in Rudy Gay and a second round pick. <laughs> for the Atlanta Hawks side of things, I understand trading John Collins, getting him out of the locker room, right? He could be toxic for the locker room. Get him out of there, you know, get off the money that he's making. But I think you could have got something better than Rudy Gay and a second round pick. You know, at that point, I, I think you just keep him and trade him at the midseason mark because you can get that trade package whenever you want, right? But I don't know, you know, I'm not in the front office, I'm not behind the scenes. Maybe John Collins just came to the office and he said, I'm not playing for this franchise again, right? So they went out there and just like, let's wash our hands with the situation. Let's get off of John Collins. 
and let's move forward with the situation, right? But Damian Lillard and the Portland Trailblazers are going to meet sometime this week, and they're going to discuss future plans. However, Damian Lillard would not give Portland a direct answer until after free agency is done. So I believe that's a good and a bad move for Dame. It puts a lot of pressure on the front office of the Trailblazers. But at the same time, if Damian Lillard is going to make Portland go out there and spend a bunch of money, and then he's going to demand a trade, I think that's kind of bad on Damian Lillard's part. But again, I mean, he's been there for 42 years, right? So, I mean, I guess you can really do whatever you want. He probably doesn't feel bad for it. But he does have interest in joining the Miami Heat if he were to be traded this offseason. Tobias Harris of the Philadelphia 76ers, he has been in trade talks as of late. And Philly has a absolutely outrageous uh, asking price for the aging veteran that's really a third option at most on a contending team. Uh, it's been reported that they asked the Cleveland Cavaliers for Jared Allen, Evan Mobley, and a first-round draft pick. That is absolutely disgusting. I understand trying to just protect your players, really say that he's not untradeable, but we're going to make him pretty much untradeable with the trade packages that we would accept. But, I mean, Tobias Harris has one year left on his deal. I mean, he's probably going to leave Philly next year if James Harden leaves and, you know, Joel Embiid wants out after next year. Philly could really explode, but uh, Tobias Harris, I mean, he's still a very talented wing. I, I really like him as a player, one of my favorite players to watch, but I just think that asking price for him is absolutely insane, right? Especially because we just saw what John Collins was traded for. But the Phoenix Suns, they plan to keep DeAndre Aiden after all the mess and all the news and rumors that have been going on. They plan to keep him to play alongside their big three moving forward. And to be honest, this just makes the most sense given the Phoenix Suns cap situation. You know, hopefully they can get a ton of vet minimums going forward. Uh, but maybe, I mean, Frank Vogel coming in as a defensive head coach, maybe he can unlock something in DeAndre Aiden. Maybe he can get something out of Aiden that we haven't seen yet. Right, maybe some aggression, but DeAndre Ayton. I mean, they if they were to trade him, Phoenix, they're not going to get you know they're they're going to get two or three pieces to come off the bench, but then they're going to have a, a void at center, right? So this team is going to struggle with depth regardless, unless we see some crazy um, <laughs> under you know low balls happen this off season as far as contracts. But I think this team's going to struggle with depth no matter what. Why not just have that that dominant of a starting five and keep DeAndre Ayton moving forward? But Nas Reed, he signs an extension with the Minnesota Timberwolves, a three-year, $42 million deal with a player option. Uh, I think he could have got, I think he could have got $50 million, to be completely honest. I think, he, I think Nas Reed could have gotten more money, but at the same time, I think, you know, staying here for two more years at the at the you know at the minimum, right? And seeing how the situation plays out, how big of a superstar can Ant turn into? Can Cat stay healthy? And if he can, how can the dynamic of Ant Cat and Rudy Gobert work on a court because that is going to be their reality moving forward. But Nas Reed, I mean, for this contract, it's a steal for the Timberwolves. It's a very team-friendly deal. And But shout-out to Nas Reed, though. You know, he had a great season, and maybe in two years, he can get that contract he's looking for, you know, upwards of $80 million type of dollars. But uh, Josh Hart and the New York Knicks, they have been in talks, and they have agreed on an extension. The number of the money will be announced sometime soon. But Josh Hart will most likely be a New York Nick next, uh, next season as he was traded there at the midseason mark last year, right? But he's going to be returning there and probably on a, on a pretty hefty contract, probably upwards of $15 million a year. But Dylan Brooks and his agent, they have contacted teams and they want over $12.5 million a year. Uh, Dylan Brooks was recently cut and he still wants over the vet, vet minimum. Um, I mean, his agent needs a raise for even attempting this, even reaching out to teams and asking this. It, 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 it's surprising to me that a player that is not a superstar level of player has been cut and he's demanding more than a vet minimum. But that is, I don't know, you know, maybe maybe a team like Dallas gets desperate and they go out there and offer Dylan Brooks that money. To me, we're going to have to see where Dylan Brooks goes, but that's just very ambitious from his agent and him as, you know, there's no guarantee he even gets a deal next year in the NBA. But finally here, we're going to close off with Thursday's show, right? And on Thursday's show, um, in just a couple days, we're going to go through the top 20 to 25 remaining free agents or so, and we're going to talk about the latest news, the latest rumors, you know, possible trade targets that might happen this offseason. Maybe we get an update on Damian Lillard, right? But you know, we're going to go through on Thursday. We're going to give our free agency predictions for the NBA. Should be tons and tons of fun. 
But that is going to do it for today's show. I mean, shorter show. A lot of these shows have been since Bakari's departure. But I mean, hey, <laughs> we're still pumping out great content for you guys. And we're still on the road to 500 subs. So if you enjoyed this video at all, if you're still here, drop a like, subscribe to the channel, or just share the podcast. It all goes a very long way as we're on this road to the next big milestone. And we really can't get there without you guys, right? So continue to support the channel. And we'll see you guys tomorrow, right, with some with some fantasy football content. We're going to look through the perfect start to your fantasy football drafts. And then on Thursday, like I said, we're going to have the free agency predictions, some more fantasy stuff on Friday. I mean, we're grinding over here, four videos a week. We're doing it all, right, as we're on the road to 500 subs. But that's another great episode in the books. We'll see you guys tomorrow with some fantasy content. Stay happy. Stay healthy. We're out.